We live, Keith? We are indeed live. A little bit late, but right. better late than that. Uh, we had some gremlins, probably Russian agents, uh, or, or crypto criminals, or Mike Arrington, or Paul Graham, or someone anyway, interfering with that was the week. But we are back. It is the week of May 14th, 2021. And this is the week where Keith has finally figured out how to become a multi-billionaire because he has figured out the venture game. So, Keith, what's the story on venture this week and how have you discovered the holy venture grail? Well, I don't know that I can take credit for having discovered the venture grail, although I've been working on trying to do that since about 2010. So... Um, it, it would be 11 years of failure followed by a brief glimmer of hope, I think. And then if that's the case, Keith, can you buy me one of these $500 million yachts that Jeff Bezos has? Um, you know, Andrew, I would buy you anything that your heart desires. You're such a good person. <laughs> good. Well, we have that on film now, so... Good, or, or at least... I'm going to go out shopping for a, for a, a, a half-billion-dollar yacht. But to be uh, serious about your question, let's put this up. Uh, this week's newsletter is Venture Capitalist Changing dot, dot, dot again. And... Um, well, I mean, to be fair, venture capital is always changing, and it always has and always will, right? Correct, which is why I added again at the end. Um, it's all hooked off... The, this article, um, it's a really, really good article about Tiger Global. Um, how to play, uh, uh, playing different games, uh, Tiger Global. And Tiger Global is, a, is an unbelievable phenomenon. It's, a, uh, it's a basically a hedge fund style venture player that is investing incredibly large sums of money very, very rapidly, way more rapidly than is normally the case. And its strategy is to um, to deploy, you know, uh, uh, roughly a billion dollars every two years. Uh, it it overpays to get into companies' rounds um, because it doesn't want it to be competitive. So it's prepared to pay overpay, and it's doing hundreds of deals um, uh, a quarter. So that that has shocked the venture world as much as SoftBank did with its Vision Fund, which is also in this week's new letter because they have a $100 billion fund and they announced a $46 billion profit. After having been in the dumps, if you remember, not that long ago when, they, when WeWork went um, in the wrong direction. So suddenly you've got this, this uh, focus on venture capital that's saying, oh my God, what's going on with all these companies doing growth investing, paying huge amounts, and deploying capital very, very quickly with very little due diligence compared to what used to be the case. So that, that triggered me to make my editorial uh, how to play the venture game because it's something I'm, A, very familiar with, and B, have a point of view about. I mean, if you really know how to play the venture game, why would you want to teach anyone else? Um, it's really hard to... It's really hard to do what I describe in the editorial. In order to do it, you would you would have to um, have done a lot of uh, da data analytics and machine learning on on many many years of data. Firstly, and then secondly, you would need to know the people that you would want to deploy money through. So it would be hard for the average person to do what I describe. So basically, Keith, my understanding of playing the venture game, in all seriousness, is hitching rides with the early stage investors who often see the best deals, have the best understanding of highly innovative companies and interesting spaces, but often are undercapitalized. Is that fair? Yeah. So if you let me show you this. This is mainly from Crunchbase. But if you look at early stage investors, which are basically angels and micro VCs, and you ask the question, how many of them are successful? And I've used here the measure of how many unicorns they invested in. In, in the case of angels, only 1% invested in two or more unicorns, 300 out of 30,000, and only 10 of them invested in lots of unicorns. 
Uh, that's people who you'd be familiar with, like Aaron Levy, the founder of Box, is one of those, for example. Um, and on the right, you've got micro venture funds, which have funds of 100 million or less. Only 1% have, have invested in, in unicorns in, in, you know, above, above a small number. And a unicorn is a, a euphemism for a winner, right? Yeah, it's a company. In fact, I'm, it's, a I'm billion, it's a plus billion dollar or a company that has a valuation of more than a billion dollars. Correct. And I'm actually being much looser there. Uh, what I did with those numbers is measured companies that were 500 million or above in valuation. So, so very so briefly, Keith, what will surprise our audience that you're discovering or that, that, that in your editorial? What are you saying that they already don't know? Well, the first thing I'm saying that they don't know is that there's no such thing as venture capital anymore. Venture capital is, is three distinct things. Okay. It's seed capital, uh, venture capital, and growth capital. Mm. Uh, seed capital typically goes in up to an A round. Uh, venture capital is typically doing a B round or a C round, sometimes right. an A. And growth capital is doing a D, E, and the growth guys are you. Would it be fair to say that the growth guys are using uh, early stage tactics to do growth? That well, so what's happened with Tiger Global is they're now backing from growth into the earlier stages, mm. having built a base in growth. They get they're now saying, well, we you know, and and, and it's worth showing the tweet uh, that's part of the editorial here because it's it's really good. This is a, a Delian from, fa from the Founders Fund. And he says, um, based on the trends in the piece, um, uh, venture returns in the 2020s are going to come from, one, mega funds doing every stage, and two, early stage value-added right. funds. Uh, and then he says, however, institutional uh, LPs, which is people who invest in funds, can't write checks into a $30 million fund. It's too small. If somebody could create the first top-tier, well-known brand you, with a fund of funds that assesses and anchors the small funds, that would be a big deal. Well, that's exactly what I'm working on. Well, you're top-tier. You are uh, Mr. Top-tier. You're Keith Tier, and you are top-tier. Uh, before we get to your, your, your little thing, Keith, um, can we say that the venture, you, you say that the venture business is changing or it doesn't really exist anymore, but would it be fair to say that the venture business is subject to exactly the same forces that every other digital market is, is, is a winner take all market where the middle is squeezed endlessly. You have a, a handful of massively powerful players and a, and a kind of long tail and not much in between. I, th I think that's true within each of the three parts that we described. So within Seed or Angels. So there still a is a venture. So there still is, you still believe that this middle tier, excusing the pun, exists. Yeah, people, people like True Ventures and Spark and, and quite a number of others. Still but in the long term, will that middle tier continue to exist or when it gets squeezed it's already been squeezed it's it's much lower it used to be everything so a hundred percent used to be venture right and if you look at these numbers this is from last year last year 12 to 13 billion was seed 86 billion was venture and 109 billion was growth so venture's already been squeezed between these two um, and it, it probably will get squeezed more. But what I don't understand is that the whole point of growth is it's relatively low risk. But you're saying now that with Tiger, growth is high risk because they're investing without a lot of um, a lot of uh, a, a, a lot of time spent. So they're behaving as if they're in the middle or first tier, but they're actually the third tier. Yeah, and they're actually backing into the first tier now. They've done a couple of deals even in the first tier. So they're, it's basically deploying capital using numbers and intelligence. Right. Um, yeah, uh, I get it. So, so what's the tier, the, the tier strategy on, on these tiers? How, how have you figured out the holy grail? Or what are you doing, Keith? 
Um, I, I, I don't want to say that I've figured it out. Um, well, because... I'm saying it. You don't have to say it, but I'm I'm your biggest fan, so I'm saying it. You can you can be shy and say, "Well, I haven't really," but we all know you have. Yeah. Well, so what I what what I what I've done uh, for the last five years in the UK is worked with a fund called ADV, and that fund um, pioneered a method of investing via seed partners, where the seed partner was a high performing seed investor. Um, here's an example I'll show you, which is um, Seed Camp, which is one of the top performing seed funds in the world and the top in the UK. And this is their, their investment UI path. And here on the right in the graph, you can see they invested in the seed round. So they're the hitching. So would it be fair to say that ADV is hitching a ride on seed camp uh, or or supporting seed camp through its companies but hitching a ride's fine that, that and you're an expert in hitching rides that's always your sort of strategy is to jump on something that's already moving and add value i'm trying to do that but so to be specific by the time the series b round came around which was the third round for you ipath seed camp was out of capital so ADV supplied it with capital, uh, doing what's known as pro rata, that is maintaining its ownership. And by doing that, we shared in the profits. And today, that money would be worth 41 times what it was when we put it in. And that was only 30 months ago. So the, the strategy here is to support the best seed managers into their best companies. And I've pulled together a team, which you can, uh, you can see here, with um, uh, Kevan Baruman, Barumand, who was the COO of Plug and Play and then went on to be the CEO of Nest GSV. All um, men, Keith. Can't you find um, any women? Or, or you know, would it be fair to say that women don't understand finance? Couldn't you have included Janae in this? She's a master in the analytic area. This is going to be a very big company, and I think there'll be lots of women <laughs> and lots of diversity in it. But having, having said that, uh, Kayvan is Persian, so we've got a little bit of diversity. Well, um, that's very but, moderate. But I think you've got to have a woman here. This is a pre-launch startup team. It's not a final team. Uh, so let's focus on what it's doing as opposed to how diverse it is, because otherwise we'll get distracted. <laughs> um, so Sean is a data scientist. He, he built the Netflix algorithm for recommendations and then went on to Amazon and then to Twitter. So we and can it, blame him for Netflix's terrible choice. And, and uh, why, Sean? Because uh, what we're doing is ranking investors through something called GP rank. And we're ranking their companies by something called company rank. And by doing that, turn this off now, we're basically able to find the best investors and their best companies. And due to the fact that they have limited capital, offer them capital to maintain their investments in those best companies and share the profits with them. And that's exactly what... Um, and that is how you play the venture game, right? It's certainly one way. There are many others, of course. But and then um, when, when, when are you going to become then this multi-billionaire? What, what has to happen next? Venture funds tend to uh, take, you know, a few years to deploy their capital, then a few more to collect the profits from it. So no time soon is the right answer, Andrew. Well, so we still have to uh, rely on Diet Coke as our investor in this program and uh, as our advertiser. I think we may well have to. Well, it's an interesting idea. And I think even I am not uh, a bit of a neophyte when it comes to finance. I think I understand what you're trying to do. What I don't understand is what happens when the big, the heavy hitters, the tiger people figure this out and they'll just squash you like they squashed everyone else. I think we have a shot at being the tiger for that early stage. Um, and, and if we do, then, um, you know, of course they're powerful and they can play, but... Uh, well, you, maybe we, you can buy them. So what are you doing? Raising money for this? I hope to raise money for this and then go on to... Uh, raise the fund that will be deployed and that will be roughly a billion dollars well when you raise the money you're going to have to employ some women right 
uh, we will partner with many women. I can promise you. Good. Well, we can partner live online. Uh, so that's how to play the venture game. Uh, another interesting story, Keith, this week. Very heartwarming one. Remarkable. Perhaps tech's most remarkable journalist, Steve O'Hear. Um, you have a, a very, I think, heartwarming story on Steve. He's, he's, a, he's a unique individual. Yeah, Steve, Steve um, and Steve, I know you listen, so uh, I hope you're not too embarrassed that I included you this week because I know you're a modest, a modest man. But um, he, he basically, uh, and let me change my share so you can see. Yeah, this. and to be fair to, to Steve, I don't want to discriminate. I mean, the fact that, you know, he's unusual physically doesn't make him unique. I, I don't know how he likes to be covered. So we have to be careful here as well. Uh, well, Steve is pretty frank about his life here in, in this story, which um, I'm showing you it from uh, Apple News, but it's actually from the UK Times, where um, he self-wrote the story of his career to date. And that's because he's moving on from TechCrunch to a new career, which uh, I think will be great for him. And he goes into all the challenges he faced um, becoming who he is. And he talks about learning his trade, mainly through financial fintech and financial services coverage. Yeah. And, um, uh, and the challenges he faced um, uh, in doing that. I think he, he's, a, he's a great person. It's a great story. And um, people should keep an eye on what he's going to do next because he's – He's a, a fantastic achiever. And I think that we should have Steve on the show. My only condition, he wears that hat. Because that's he a very always, cool hat. I think he pretty much always wears that hat. So well, I Steve, you're more than welcome to come on the show and uh, maybe even replace me. I'm sure you can do a better job, not hard. Okay, so we have the Steve O'Hare story. We have how to play venture. And we're back with China, Keith. You can't leave China alone. What's going on with China this week? Last week, we spent... A lot of time talking about China, and it's back in the news. A small country in Asia. What could they be doing? You know, I, I thought that we had to do it this week because last week was all about China, and I just wanted people who listen to us to be aware of this story, which was in the Harvard Business Review. It's written by uh, Wei Zhan Shan, who is Chinese, based in Hong Kong now, but born in China, who writes a great quite lengthy essay uh, titled Americans Don't Know How Capitalist China Is. And it's basically, uh, um, it's something every American should read if they care about the future of America's relationship to the world and want to understand China's place within it. It's very thoughtful it, 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 in understanding China's um, motives and goals. I, I, and I mean, my, my response to that is I don't think I mean, and most Americans don't know anything about China and don't think anything about China. But I think that Americans' hostility to China is twofold. Firstly, China is actually too capitalist. They're too successful and they're outwitting the Americans. And secondly, China is a political dictatorship, perhaps even a totalitarian system, which seems to be able to coexist with capitalism. So I'm not sure how many Americans actually doubt how capitalist China is? Well, well, well. Some do. I mean, the, the fact that it's called communist is a joke. Yeah, but, um, but that's the Chinese decision. That's not the American decision. The Chinese have decided to maintain their brand, but pursue a different kind of economic system. That's got nothing to do with the Americans. Well, it's it's more subtle than that. I mean, oh, yes, you're right. The Ch the party is called the Chinese Communist Party or the Communist Party of China. And they're the ruling party, and they pursue the a capitalist party. economic model. Yeah, so that's true, but um, I, therefore they get labelled communist, but they are actually capitalist. So once you start with the fact that they're actually capitalist, a bit like Singapore, a one-party state capitalism, um, then you start to think of it differently. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, Wei Jin Shan is certainly very useful in helping us do that. I don't want to repeat verbatim what's in it because people mm, should. Well, it's, it's an interesting piece and it's well worth reading. And it, it certainly supports Keith's um, relentless attempt to get beyond the nation state. Is that fair, Keith? To internationalize everything. 
Uh, I would like to do that, but I fear the rise of China might delay that a little bit. Um, and of course, another area where uh, the nation state is under assault is, is, is the financial system and cryptocurrencies. The dollar key might be history, at least according to uh, maybe not the dollar itself, but the dollar's role in the international financial system might be history. According to quote unquote legendary investor Stanley Druckenmiller. Stanley Druckenmiller, um, he's certainly not a legend to me, but I've seen his name before. So isn't clearly... that his first name? Legendary? Legendary. That's could be. That would that'd be a good first name. People would have to call it legendary all the time. If you make your billion, I'm gonna rename Keith Legendary. You'd be called Legendary Tier. But he, he makes the point that um the Federal Reserve is buying 60% of all government debt issued. Uh, and that it, were that not the case, the bond markets would be rejecting the debt and the US would be in, in deep doo-doo. Yeah. And he's projecting that it's possible the US will lose its world currency reserve status for the dollar due to everything that's happening now. He doesn't put a time on that, but he, yeah, that's something... It, it, it's a hugely... Imp I mean, in all seriousness, it's a hugely important story. So put it in simple language, Keith, that uh, anyone could understand. America is borrowing trillions of dollars. Yeah, and printing, and, and, and printing notes to sustain that. When you say um, printing notes, meaning committing government putting the government behind the borrowing so that governments yeah. or states can't go bust. Yeah. Well, the, well, the, strictly speaking, the Federal Reserve is independent of government, but the Federal Reserve is buying government debt and funding that by printing money. And we so, have confidence in that because America has enormous, you know, I mean, you can't... Yeah, if you assume that America is going to continue to grow and be the strongest economy in the world, probably it can manage this debt, a yep. little bit like Manchester United can manage the debt the Glazers have put on it. But what Stanley is saying is it can't do that, that the dollar is being devalued. And because most debt in the world is accounted for in dollars, it means the receipts that people are going to get when they get the dollars are actually going to be worth a lot less than they thought they were going to get. And that endangers world uh, value transfers. And his assumption is that therefore nations will stop wanting to be paid in the dollar. They'll want to be paid in something else that's more stable than the dollar. And maybe bring China back into this. How does this affect the Chinese-American relationship? Well, in interesting enough, in the China article, it's pointed out that China has no ambition to become the world reserve currency, either with its digital um, renminbi or with its physical one, because it's much more introvert in the way it thinks. It doesn't really have global management ambitions as such. So there's a void, and into that void, he predicts Bitcoin could go. Right. So the international currency, uh, the, the dollar will be replaced by, if not Bitcoin, certainly some sort of cryptocurrency. Potentially. It's certainly, uh, you know, a basket of currencies has been the previous favorite so that there's no single dominant currency. That's usually a hybrid. But it does seem logical that a digital equivalent that holds its value would make some sense for nations who have to uh, buy and sell from each other and get paid. And this, if this happens, this changes everything in the world. This would be the most important change so far, certainly this century, if not since the Second well, World War. Since Bretton Woods, actually. Right. So this, in all seriousness, this is, this is enormously consequential in terms of great power politics, how we live, everything, right? Yeah. It's about, actually, ultimately, it's about peace. If you want peace, you need, you need stable global transfers. Well, it's more than about peace. It's about America's role in the world. Yeah, that too. Um, it's about this Chinese, the, the, the new great power uh, tension, rivalry between China and America. It's everything. Um, I still don't understand how it will work, given that nothing stands, I mean, we've, we've talked about this before, nothing stands behind crypto uh, in order to give it the confidence, but... 
in, in a, very, in a world. very architecture of the finance, the world's the global financial system is changing. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's going to change quickly. But actually, what's interesting is the receptivity to discussing it is now opening up. Um, actually, the the World Bank already has, and the IMF already has something a little bit like this. Um, uh, they're called, I think it's called special drawing rights, XRD, uh, XDRs. And special drawing rights is this made up currency that sits on top of a basket of other currencies. So when Greece defaults on its debt, it gets some special drawing rights from the IMF, yeah. um, uh, which is not a currency. So there's, there's kind of a manual version of this already emerging. And it seems likely the, uh, the world needs a, a you know, a more rigorous automated version. Uh, as much as I don't really understand, certainly the the intricacies of this, it's it's fascinating. And it, and it speaks to, you've already said that the venture industry is changing dramatically. The global international financial system is changing. And of course, the other thing that's changing everything are SPACs. What's happening on the SPAC front this week? Um, SPACs have had a hard couple of weeks, actually. Um, the, the, the way everyone will remember the way a SPAC works is the, the organizers uh, take, take themselves public at a valuation of $10 per share, and then they go and seek to merge with a company. And hopefully when that's announced, the share price goes up. What's been happening is after announcing a merger, many of the SPACs have continued to trade at only $10 a share. So the bump that, investors expect hasn't been uh, occurring thus confidence in a SPAC as a way of, sh of short-term gain uh, is eroded a little bit so your friend the guy whose name begins with p and is very hard to pronounce has he gone bankrupt yet or is he still making money uh, he's his the SPAC isn't he just as stanley is the legendary investor chamath has five SPACs Two of them are already trading as public companies, Open Door and Clover Health. Uh, so, uh, SoFi, which is one of his SPACs, hasn't yet started trading, but is at $15 a share. And then he has two other SPACs, which are a pre-merger announcement that are, are in and around $10 a share. So, you know, it's... Um, it, it's uh, it's interesting. There are those that say this is a bubble bursting. I don't believe that. This is this is nothing like the period I talk about in the editorial in 2000 when the internet bubble yeah. burst. This, this is, is not pets.com. This is, no. this is not stupid startups that have absolutely no logic or no reason to exist. This is something much more profound and more important. And your startup of the week is one of the, the, the pin-up companies of this profound structural shift. Who they are they, Keith? They are Coinbase, uh, but not because of being in crypto. Um, it's because they announced this week, having previously banned politics in the workplace, they're now banning salary negotiations, which sounds like a bad thing, but actually it's a really good thing. Or maybe they're learning banning from the Chinese. Um, what they've announced is that they're going to strictly... Uh, maintain bands of salary and based on who you are and your experience and your skills and actually your stage of life, you'll be put into a band and that will be a the band salary. Or a band? Um, a grade, let's call it. Yeah. Um, a tier. A tier. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you'll be put into a tier. That doesn't, sounds painful. Yeah. Um, and, and therefore, um, you know, the normal thing that happens, which is somebody with a personality gets paid more than somebody that doesn't have one. And that, by the way, men as well often get paid more than women. because That's women why you up. get paid a lot more for this show than I do. Could be. Could be. It's the difference between nothing and nothing, but <laughs> if you insist. <laughs> well, I get my diet coke. Um, anyway. Um, they're, but, they're, but, they're, uh, uh, two responses to that. Firstly... It is an interesting move, and I, I think, it, as you say, it certainly um, probably looks good from the point of view of women who tend to be underpaid. But the whole point of companies like Coinbase is that whatever you're paid is irrelevant. It all depends on stock. So is are they banning negotiating on 
equity too? Does everyone get the same within the tier or the band? You get the same equity. In, interestingly, yes, and they've annualized it. So the whole normal method in the Valley of a four-year vesting with a one-year cliff, where you work for 12 months and then you get 25% of the stock you've been promised, and then monthly after that, they're scrapping that. They're giving people annual stock grants um, every year, which they say will um, help retention because it will give annual reasons to want to stay. And annual reasons to get rid of you too. Are they any good? This company, Coinbase, Keith. Um, they're, they're, we, we talked before that their, their stock didn't really take off. They're very, very good, Andrew. I mean, this is a this is a, a young founder who's just an, an exceptional job in in a market that no one believed in, of building the you know one of the two world leaders in the space. The other one being Binance, which was uh, done by a young. Um, Chinese-born um, founder, uh, who's now a Canadian, I think. Um, CZ is his name. Well, finally, Keith, go back to China. You keep on bringing it up. Um, the tweet of the week is a China tweet. Yeah, this I, I couldn't resist this. Um, this is by Carl Jia, who I, I assume is Chinese. Here comes the Chinese space station. The U.S. banned China from the International Space Station. No problem. China will just build its own. And if we uh, if we click on it, this is. That you know what? That's the metaphor for Keith, your new uh, investment tool. It could well be Signal Rank taking off. <laughs> I mean, this is obvious and inevitable in all seriousness. Um, I don't know why anyone would even think anything else is conceivable. Ch China, the Chinese economy now is 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 as is as highly, almost as highly valuable as the American economy. So it's just the well, nature of things. You yeah, know, I mean, countries yeah. rise and fall, and uh, China is rising, and America is falling. That's just yeah. When China took, uh, when America took one small step for man, one great step for mankind, it didn't invite Britain to have anyone on, on, on the spaceship, even though Britain was only recently the world leader through colonialism and imperialism. And uh, it looks as if China isn't inviting America, but only because America said first, you're, you're not included which was, I think, a huge mistake. I, I personally think space should be internationalized and there should not be national initiatives. There should be global initiatives. And it's one of the most obvious things, but we're not there yet. We're still, we're still a human race divided by nations. And sadly, that is gonna spill out into space as well. And if space is owned by Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, will that be an American space or a Musk Bezos space? You know, they're really just like the guys who sold you the wagons and the horses for the great trek from the East Coast to the West Coast of America during the time of the pi pioneers. They're, they're, they're for hire. Bezos and Musk are for hire. Governments are the real, you know, buyers there. Well, we have something to look forward to then. Chinese space, Keith Tier. That was the week for uh, May the 14th. We were back on the 21st, with no doubt more news on crypto, SPACs, China, and venture capital. Have a great week, Keith, and I'll see you next week. I will see you indeed. Bye-bye.